Okay. Go live. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our final event of the Poetic Vision series. Um, you can see all, all of our readers here. Um, and uh, I'd like to also introduce our co-host, Charlene Shepherdson of Singlet Station. Hi, everyone. Uh, uh, I'm Jake Schneider, the uh, Editor-in-Chief of SAND, and um, we are here um, looking at poetry that was influenced or inspired or um, in relationship with the visual arts and the sciences as the third and final installment of our Poetic Visions series. Um, and uh, we are really, really excited to be here um, just to give a little bit of a background. Um, so we've had uh um we've had first a uh, presentation by four poets who write um inspired or influenced by the visual arts and the sciences um as sort of a panel about a month ago um a, a webinar and then there was also a um and each of the, those four poets um introduced a writing invitation um to sort of share their practice with other um, writers um, who are interested in this kind of um, exploration. And, uh, and then we had a, a second workshop with our one of our two um, poetry editors, Krista Siglin, um, about two weeks ago. And now a whole bunch of people who were either part of the workshop or, um, or just tried out one of these prompts in uh, many of these prompts end up being combined with each other in different ways. There, there wasn't, you know, um, no rules that you had to follow uh, anything one-to-one -one and, um, and made their own poems. And so we're gonna hear some of those poems uh, today. And um, we also have, um, so Charlene Shepherdson, um, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about uh, Singpo Rimo or Singpo Rimo. Sure. Um, so Singer Station runs an annual poetry challenge every April um, here in Singapore. It's called Singapore Poetry Writing Month. Uh, we call it Singapore Remo for short. Um, it's basically been around for eight years now. And so for every day of April, um, we give out a, pro a prompt a day. So we've got 30 prompts uh, in April. And then we've got about a Facebook group of about 6,900 people right now who kind of share, uh, uh, they'll share poems, they'll love to read those poems, they'll give to it on each other. Yeah, and that's um, some of the readers that you'll get today come from that community as well. Um, great. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're, we're all figuring out our technology, but, um, but we won't all be on screen the whole time. So um, I would love to introduce our first group of readers, um, just to uh, give a little bit of the structure of today's reading. We'll be here for about an hour, maybe a little bit over, um, and we'll have four different sections of readings for you all. Um, and they're basically divided into uh, two groups because we've got um, readers who came to this event through SAND um, and through the series, and also readers who came to the event through um, Singpo Remo and Singlet Station. Um, um, but they've all been responding to uh, some of these same prompts from the series. So our first, uh, our first group, uh, sorry, so there'll be four readings, uh, four groups of readings. Um, and the first group will be um, starting with Erica Kilsgaard. Um, and Erica Kilsgaard is, um, teaches English literature and creative writing for the City University of New York and is an alumna of Brooklyn College's MFA program where she serves as the editor as an editor of at large of the Brooklyn Review. Her poems have found generous homes in Bone Bouquet, Cordella Magazine, The Pen Review, and others. Most recently, you can find her fiction in Maudlin Housing Here Read for the Brooklyn Rails New Social Environment number 226 Radical Poetry Reading. And um, I, uh, I can't see the comments on YouTube right now, but um, basically everything that we have uh, that I'll be reading these bios, um, a lot of the links and things that I mentioned are actually on the SANS webpage. So um, there's a link to her reading there, um, which you can listen to later. Um, I'm really looking forward to hearing it, Erica. Um, and 
um, our second reader, uh, Nora uh, Najarian, is a cypress-based poet and short story writer whose work has appeared in numerous journals and anthologies around the world. Her poetry was included in Being Human from Blood Axe Books uh, and Capitals, uh, and most recently in the Live Canon Anthology 2020. I'm really looking forward to your reading, Nora. And our third reader uh, from the first segment is Kate Segriff. Uh, she's a Canadian writer, filmmaker, and visual artist. Her work has appeared in Prism International, Prairie Fire, and Storm Cellar magazines, among others. Her feminist short films have been selected for over 50 film festivals worldwide. Um, it's great to have you with us. And uh, now without further ado, I'd like to introduce um, our first reader, Erica Kilsgaard. Thank you, Jake. Thank you, Sand, and thank you, Singlet. Um, as we gather here to share a very human thing, um, I wanted to dedicate my reading uh, to voices we once heard but can no longer hear in occupied Palestine, in Colombia, and worldwide. Um, one other um, thing I wanted to say is one of the source texts that I was working with um, and what I'm about to read was Adaptive Coloration in Animals by zoologist Hugh B. Cott. And very unsettingly, this was only the only track to ever be packed in a soldier's kit bag. Okay, let's see. Um, all right, so I'm reading from Disruptive Patterns for Protective Concealment. L1, analogous arrangement. Can you see the resemblance? Dream decoy, compound eyes, catch, separated in an ascending part, terminal non-visual, spine, the area between defined by the surrounding fragile, runs freely toward the mandible as a toehold, appears, an even plane. The polarity of this character cannot clarify. L2, tactical silence to prevent or delay as long as possible the first recognition of an object by sight, the function of posturing as prey of the prey, a flower reincarnates, large cones. Try to understand how to share space, alluring coloration, nearing sensorial origin, mimetically, a bold transverse, bar of deep sage green on the thorax. L3, I went down, lay bile. Reality exceeds my wildest expectations. Decapitating death, vegetal soul, stability in the lyrical exoskeleton, multi-species intermission, charged with arrows, I believe. Reunion of blind love defenestrates time, heterogeneous space, in a sense, self-feeling. L4, part artificial flower, unspecifiable, beyond use, membrane opus, Nomenclature concealed, coronata, awakens echoes, I change with you, the substance of attentive fidelity. Orchid manis synecdoche, cross kingdom, exercise, in Thanatos, dear Luce, my name too becomes. L5. Imperceptible, minute, sacrifice, life, mine, only, to end. Meaning the circle is beginning, a spiral at last, for the sake, 
understanding, exhausting then, if loveless, still in progress, a hyper-developed lens, when morning, spines, shared hour. Thank you. So um, thank you, San Journal. Thank you, Singlet Station, for this invitation. And I'm very happy to be reading a poem which was inspired by the sculptures of hyper-realist artist Carol Foreman. A woman makes a room for a woman. Synchronized swimming demands advanced water skills, requires great strength, endurance, flexibility, grace. Think of the grace on each face, artistry and precise timing. Think especially of the timing, as well as exceptional breath control while giving birth when upside down underwater. Sleeping beauties on shelves, synchronized sleeping in shiny bikinis and swimming caps in glass cases, the faces of women who have plunged into deepest pools together, given birth underwater, and are perfect and empty and empty and perfectly empty. A woman makes a womb for a woman. She pours the fetus into the mold like God wearing surgical gloves. The mother's hands rest calmly on her belly. There's a handshake on the work table. Men are absent elsewhere. The two women shake hands. Thank you. Okay. Um, I just want to thank everybody as well. I'm just going to dive right into it uh, because mine's a bit long. It's inspired by uh, the Picasso painting, Lagomose. I am Lagomose, lips redder than nipples rubbed raw by some careless courtesan or the paint stains hands of Picasso. Flowering in some sunny corner of, of an apartment on the Boulevard de Clichy, wrapped in art arrogance and the carnal pleasures of youth. I am a product of the blue period, depression fueled, monochrome, fragile, a shimmer of despair mitigated by an aura of dignity and grace, or so they say. And why not? I'll go along and along and along as long as you promise to simply skim my surfaces. I'm inspired by a legacy of celebrated madmen and a long list of similar beasts who careen through the streets of antiquity. Brooding crows collecting their credit with shiny strands of gold leaf, they line the nest and then press me beneath their feathered bodies. Long nosed and velvet wrapped, they declare me a siren, unabashed by my nakedness, my defiant eyes fixed on the singular prize of their gilded reflections. I am also a figure of solitude, they say, a lonely body pressed against an empty background of cobalt and white. But if I am appraised with an honest gaze, I will turn inward. Concave shoulders, I shiver in this drafty cage of high beams, clutter, and carved wood. I am tired, tired of standing still, of fixing my eyes on the slick backs of blackbirds, tired of being drawn, painted upon, but look closer. See how I tilt my pelvis, see how I tilt my pelvis just so, a winking eye, the rise of a lioness's smile. Under thick, under layers of thick cerulean, I exist. There persists a joie de vivre, an area of Paris, perhaps, desirous, but not yet ready to rise from my cerulean pool. Observe me as I shrug, as if to say, so what, Picasso? So what of your dreary brushstrokes, your singular engagement in the existential questions of life, love, duality, fate, and death? So what to your angst about another bloodstained ami, the parade of your familiars who march sprightly toward the white stone edges of the Seine? We all have our hard luck ditties and seek to shed the shackles of this realism. 
painting over creeping stains of our crumbling ceilings, leaving our masterpieces scattered, abandoned in lonely abodes in the attics of old aunties and other such oppressors. We, we have blurred ourselves, slopped a brush across our cheeks, applied a thin coat of snow, transformed our deep lines into a kind of temporary beauty. The pink smaller collars smeared across my neck as a talisman, for you will soon leave this cobalt coolness, this absinthian haze, and pursue a new pathway of warm rose and ochre, where Madame Fernande awaits you amidst a rowdy crowd of jostling jugglers, long-limbed acrobats, harlequins, harlots, and clowns. But I must demure, Picasso, refuse to, to pursue you. I will remain as I am, La Gomuse, destitute darling of the dying embers of the Belle Epoque, bloat belly bloated with the angst and ennui of an army of melancholy men who have poured themselves into me like clotted cream. I will not submit my reddest bits to your deconstruction, will not allow you to splay my face wide, reduce me to an aesthetic arrangement of side-lying triangles and asymmetric oval parts. I will remain slouched and, and close-shouldered in your Paris abode, staring past your feverish, unwashed scalp, awaiting a future, some day of perfection, when your procession of madmen will lie lined like boned fish in their tin graves, painted over by layers of soil and innocent whispers of their presumed preciousness. Onward to the day when some pale and efficient hand will sweep me from the plush carpets of Sotheby's for the cool sum of 67.5 million. A handsome prize to be sold for if you are to be sold. Sold as we are all are to the highest bidding bourgeois, the ones who would possess us and sell our spirits as their own. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Erica, Nora, and Kate. That was a great start to this entire event. Uh, yeah, so as Jake introduced me just now, I'm Charlene Jepson. I'm the general manager of Singlet Station. Uh, Singlet Station is a nonprofit organization in Singapore that works to develop Singapore literature, uh, which we call uh, Singlet for short. Yeah, um, so what I'm going to do next is I'm going to introduce another group of tree readers from Singapore. Um, and as I introduce their names, they're going to come up um, and show you their faces and then read their pieces after. Right, so first up, let's have Aisha Mandira, who is an arts organizer right here in Singapore. She's the executive producer and co-host of the Soli La Dagan podcast series on Singapore Tamil literature. She also received the NAC, National Arts Council Singapore's Golden Point Award uh, for second prize for the Tamil poetry in 2019. We will also have Lun Lo, who is a trans lesbian writer. She is a core member of SABA, uh, Stop at Bad End Rhymes, a Singaporean writing collective. Uh, and she's currently an undergraduate at the National University of Singapore. Uh, in the last person for the set, least but not, last but not least, is Ang Shuang, whose works has been published by the Asian American Writers Workshop, The Rumpers, and Tinderbox Poetry Journal. She graduated with an MFA from the Sarah Lawrence College and is now working on her debut collection and her rescue dog. <laughs> Hopefully you get appearance from her, from it, from her later. <laughs> okay, so uh, without further ado, let's have Aisha to take us away. Hi everyone. Thank you, Shaleen, for the introduction and thanks to the Singlet Station to, for inviting me to this, to this wonderful um, meeting of poets. And, uh, and also to send. The poem that I'll be reading today, um, I'll be reading it in two languages. So first I will be reading it uh, in the original language that I wrote it in, uh, in Tamil, my mother tongue, uh, more commonly known as Tamil, uh, and also in English, which comes accompanied with an illustration, a very humble attempt at illustrating by me. Um, so this poem, was inspired by uh, the incident of an artist in Hong Kong who uh, in the middle of a protest when uh, it was happening in, in 2019, he was painting on a canvas, whatever he was witnessing in the protest. And um, what I wanted to do is to imagine what would have gotten infused in the paint that went into that painting uh, that he did um, with the purpose of, of uh, evading Chinese censorship. So that, that was the purpose that he, he told the New York Times. Uh, and, and that was the article that I read, which inspired me to write this poem. So I'll first read it in Tamil. And um, before anyone reads my translation, I, I would like to ask everyone to just listen to the sound of 
the Tamil um, that I'm reading before I go on to my translation. So first, um, my poem in Tamil, it's titled Urusittirathin Varalaru or Urusittirathil Varalaru, which directly translates as the history of a painting or the history in a painting or through a painting. So here goes. Marmangal, Maradigalaga Maridi. Maradigal, Marmangalaga Maria. Marivigalum, Marmamaga, Marandapoi Vitana. Marmangal, Maradigalaga Maridi. Maradigal, Marmangalaga Maria. Marivigalum, Marmamaga, Marandapoi Vitana. Maribadium Maraka Vida, Maritadu, Ovier in Manam. Saritira Kaya Tarumugalin, Vandangaludan Muyanga, Avaludan Amandir in the Will, Sitira Pardon. Sutrium, Karigalum, Parindigalum, Chittakurvigalida Mirinde, Pitirinda, Siragalum, Kurudi Chuttakal, Paraka, Yedipulita, Daddy Kuralgalum, Yedirulita, Daddy Adigalum, Kavalgalum, Wolangalum. Surum satangalil, nene with a pea. Kachikulla the Kankali putti. Tanayum porali ai, yeni a pardam. Other mamuria, Kuraluya the adal. Nadinga the turigium. Marathapona or irimbu manam. Turi kundir in the Upanir tuliganum. Pine the kundir in the Kandir yerivayum. Selithia uraivigalil. Adhum Kalamanadu. Now my poem in English, it's a transcreation. And um, I felt a very strong urge to do this illustration because I wanted to carry over the weight that I, I feel that Tamil has over into English. And I thought the illustration would help it. So here's my transcreation. This is actually the umbrella part of the illustration. It's actually not meant to be read aloud, um, but I'll be reading it aloud just in case it's, it's not too visible on the website. Painted history, which can be read as paint history or pained history. Missing memories, missing memories, memories, mistakes, missing mistakes. Morphing, memories, missing, mystery, minds, memories, missing, mysteries, memories, mysteries, memories, missing, memories, mistakes, missing, memories, missing, memories, morphing, missing, memories, mistakes, missing, memories, missing, missing, memories, minds, missing, minds. The canvas is sitting before the artist, waiting to be infused with color, encircling it, Eagles and falcons, clasping onto dismembered sparrows, blood drops splattering. Echoes of sobs, sobs, wails, sobs, help, sobs, beatings, beatings, screams, gun, fire, gun, fire, gun, fire. Stop, help, cries, sobs, Beatings, beatings, sobs, help, sobs, wails, sobs, gun, fire, gun, fire, gun, fire, sobs, wails, help, sobs, wails, gone, fire, gone, fire, gone, fire, gone, 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 fire. Prickled by an unwavering brush, Sprinkles of salty water and sprays of tear gas. The canvas is tickled, writhing, writhing, tickled. The canvas is dead. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Singlet Station. Thank you, San Journal. And thank you, Alicia. My goodness, these are 
such wonderful poems that all we have been reading tonight. Um, well, for me, well, I'm, I'm going to read a piece that, um, that I realized that was based, well, I, it, it is a critique of science, it is a critique of gender, and it is a critique of, I mean, it is, and, and it's also an expresses that I did for um, Singapore Poetry Writing Month. And, um, and yes, so, uh, how am I going to say this? Uh, and, and, it's, and it's called, and this is a praxis of uh, Manes Olympia, but also uh, a reading of uh, the, the French philosophers, Iri Garay's Women on the Market. And, and so, yeah, uh, and, it's, it's, and if, if you know what's Olympia, like Manes Olympia, it depicts a, a courtesan, uh, I mean, a white European courtesan uh, being tended to by a, I mean, naked not a bit, but also being tended to by a, uh, by, by a black person, a brown black person who is a slave. And, and this is just a poem that was, well, um, <laughs> I was inspired to write this poem, and it's it's in the form of uh, Udai Yatatu. I I'm not sure if I'm butchering the the name, but uh, I mean it is a derived form. After all, uh, it's like the, the original form in Tamil is it's probably a lot more complex than 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 it is. But it is a it is a it is essentially a form of repetition, and there is there are central words that are being repeated. So, okay. So this is uh, women as use value uh, after Manes Olympia, after Rigores, women on the market, um, content warnings for sexual and graphic violence, misogyny and capital. Capital with the big C, of course. Feudal as father killed by capital, who is son capitalizing on the feudal relations of women Name capital who are nothing but the names of capitals, relations in the logic of capital crime. The sciences are complicit in capital. Take a race, for instance, a label by capital like baked beans, complicit with its nutritional values in capitals. This stands regarding capital everyone knows, but only with the work done for, not against capital. Reading how, regarding how both Olympia and a servant and the capital, the commodities of a masculinized capital, is not enough. How our asses, our sight, are uh, ruminated by capital. Do I, commodities, are like Oedipus Rex, I, this women. Mother is capital. Our cause, like his. Eyes ripped, Olympia gone, capital still alike. Thank you so much. Hey, um, I'll be reading a poem titled Self Portrait as Judith with the Head of Colophonies. And I wrote this poem uh, mainly to interrogate the notion that women, especially in um, the olden times, were portrayed to only be aggressive or violent for, you know, like the greater good. And I wanted um, it to be a humanizing poem. Yeah. They say I did it for my city. He was coming to smash our gates, to shuck us clean. And I was, after all, already dirty. The pearl popped from my oyster, lost. Outside his tent were flowers, still unpicked, petals slick with fresh dew. He was hungry and thought me free for the taking. I patted the flaps and entered. After it was over, I wrapped the blossom between my wine-stained fingers until it caved, bleeding. They say I did it for God, for all of men. And yes, it was men I was thinking of when I thrust my sword in him and pulled it out slick with the juice of crushed cherries when I walked home with his head between my thighs. I was hungry and he wasn't a bit fellow fit for my liking. Thank you.
Thank you so much. This is this has been really incredible watching um, all the different ways that each of you has has responded to these um, also very different um, works of art. And uh, yeah, it, the 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 seams are um, are softer and and more permeable than sometimes we realize. Um, uh, so I'm really excited to introduce the next uh, group of uh, four readers, um, which beginning with Gita uh, Raleigh, who is a writer and medical doctor with work in the Bellevue Literary Review, Wasafiri, and Magma Poetry. She teaches creative writing to medical students and has an MSc in the medical humanities. Her poetry collection, A Terrible Thing, is published by Bad Betty Press. Looking forward to it. Um, our second uh, reader for the um, for this segment is actually the one sort of um, intermingled intersection um, uh, in this whole reading, um, which is um, because Winifred is both a Berliner and a Singaporean. Um, um, and um, so uh, Winifred Wong is a Singaporean writer based in Berlin. Her work has been published in Soft Blow, Yahoo, and Esplanade Theatres. Her EP, Things I'm Afraid to Tell You, is available on all streaming platforms, and I've been meaning to listen to it up to listen to it later today. Her debut short play, Alexa, will be screened at the Kreuzberger Hofbestspiele later this year. Our next reader, um, Dr. Patricia Falkenburg, is a molecular biologist, a poet writing in German and English, and a visual artist. Hi, Patricia. Um, born in 1961 in Mannheim, she currently lives in Pulheim, which is near Cologne. Her poems have been published in numerous anthologies, journals, and blogs. Her collection, Portuguesische Notizen, Portuguese Notes, was published in 2019 as Lyrik Heft 24 by Sonnenberg, Sonnenberg Presse, Chemnitz, sorry, I keep having to switch um, accents mid-sentence. Um, I'm very much looking forward to um, uh, to your reading. And our last uh, reader for this segment is Ben Luton, who is a student of C.D. Wright and an avant-garde radio artist from the Gulf Coast of the U.S., with a notable distinction of a of Hurricane, Hurricane Katrina refugee, which I, it's interesting that you call that a notable distinction. Um, um, her, his poetry can be found in Lana Turner and his extra, extraterrestrial dispatches on Radio Free Brooklyn. And there, there's a link to that on the website um, page. Um, looking forward to, to your reading as well. And um, without further ado, um, let's hear our first reading by Gita Raleigh. Hi, I think you need to. Um, oh, I have. Yeah. I have to invite you back because I I banished you. Yes. Um, hold on. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Oh, thank you so much, everyone. It's so amazing to be here and to feel these kind of, um, you know, uh, links of poetry going across the globe, um, especially in the times that we're living through now. Uh, my poem was inspired by. Uh, two of the uh, workshops looking at uh, gender and power and responsibility and how these things interact. And particularly in the way that um, particularly young adult films such as The Hunger Games have created a sort of trope, I feel, of the young girl as the savior of the world and how that interacts with um, our views of you know, real young girls such as Greta Thunberg or Ex Gonzalez, who's a survivor of the Marjorie Stone, Stoneman Douglas High School shooting, and how this kind of burden and responsibility of, of being the young girl who's going to save the world is, in some ways, a really unfair one to put on such young shoulders. And it's called Girl at the End Times. One girl stands on the battlefield. Around her lie numberless dead, defeated, or sleeping. Their black mouths round open, slack as fishes, gulping a copper sky. Two, girl is embodied flight without fear, 
a seasoned warrior, skilled markswoman, hip flanked by quivers of arrows. Her gaze holds true down a gun's long barrel. Girl is eye patched, thin sutured, shaven headed. She has welded her own armor, learned how to fight from a grandmother, learned how to lie from a lover. Four. Girlhood ended in infernal machines, assemblages of unmoving parts. Girl is a lone girl now. She drives her swords into presidents, sets loose her tipped arrows, squint, take aim. Five. Girl walks her abandoned charnel grounds. Above her, bullets land hard as rain. Below her, blood seeps rivers into the soil. Everyone she loved is dead of the end times. Girl weeps for our swiftly turning earth. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, so uh, the first poem I'm going to read is inspired by Tritanda Mensch. It's a sculpture here in Berlin that's right by Golitza Park. Um, so I took notice of it because the legs look like they were going someplace and yet from another perspective, they look like they're backing away from something. And I also noticed that it was really corroded. So to me, it felt like it wanted to disappear and yet it was still so visible. And I felt that contradiction quite acutely. So this is a response to Shreitanda Mensch. Striding men, the legs forwards, back, dancing, quiet feet together, hiding a secret by a donut basin, half squatting, ready to pounce. Of course, it was a striding man, many doing exactly that here with the big dogs. I wanted to climb it 14 meters and be on top of this earth fragment. It's called striding men and not striding women because mothers obliged when sons asked for ice cream but gave their daughters restraint instead. Striding men is strident and no one can keep up. Striding man is walking away from the violence he fertilized when he talked down to his woman. Tom asked me why I didn't do my nails and I told him I played the guitar. He made me play for everyone. Tom asked me to let down my hair and I said yes and leaned into the camera for him to see better. Tom said I did my hair up real nice. I thanked him. To I thanked him instead of, there are battles to fight and there are battles to fight. I meet a friend who insists on always buying me dinner. I suppose he really feels like a man doing that. Anyway, I saw it jarring from a distance and I would like to sit in the crevice of knees connected perhaps by a street jacket. It was rusted. I put my palm on it and licked. I tasted blood from steel as old as me. Nothing could kill me now. Thanks. The next poem is, uh, something that I wrote during Singapore Raimo, which happened just last month in April. This is called House Home, after a gift for you by Eileen Miles. Yesterday after work, I went down to the canal before the sun gave up on me, but there was a film crew of about 50 covered in amber light FFP2 masks and boredom. They stopped me from interrupting their efforts. What I really want in life is for me to tell people not to interrupt my efforts. It was the closest thing to a party I've seen in the past year and a half, so I hung around soaking the life in. Watching a lady across the street walking her dog, I saw her face scrunched up like this. I now know two dogs named Lola, but only one I can pet weekly. I want one too, but my house is small and large. There is no sex in this house, but it still feels like a hotel room. I am emptying for my friends to think well of me. That's why I bought an asparagus steamer in white asparagus season, but I still left the roughage on stems that come away in my mouth like drenched split hay. The last one I'm gonna leave you with is called Hear the Wind Sing. Like the pigeon I see on my way to the subway, will someone bury it? It is on the car park tarmac. If anyone has to move it, it should be the next Parker. Maybe they are going for a concert and fancy. Now they have to roadkill. If I had a shovel or something, it rots more each day. The work flies. It is summer. More will breed in homes. More will come. One day, only the bones will be left. It will be easier to sweep up then. Just the white bones. Thanks so much. Thank you. 
Hi, uh, I'm sorry, Patricia, uh, you're, you've been muted, so I, I'm afraid you have to start again. Can you can you unmute yourself? Yeah, I did it. I'm sorry. <laughs> so let's start again. I said I brought you two poems, and I won't make many much many words around them beforehand, but jump right in. So I jump back. Watching Carol Fireman sculpturing room. Watching the artist, flowing hair, accurate hands in her factory of art, laying out bandages to hold a child inside the mother and behold the child and the womb that cradles it and the mother's two-handed caress to be made more real than life itself. And well do I know that careful twin caress of caring mother right of nine months practice three times over and laid out on a table, plastic cups, water, vaseline, scissors, don't forget the scissors and how she embraces the child inside, nothing but a thought to the spectator, nothing but a thought penetrating a surface, perfected beyond reality. Time to apply the silicone and the clock is ticking. Time to apply the plaster, bandages, and are there ripples through the room as the material sets and stiffens? Bare feet under a black cloth. And come on, baby, kick it as mom sits still for perfection. But how it must twitch and kick and storm. Breathing, sitting. Breathing, setting. Time to take it off. The iconic lady in the golden bikini is doing her yoga all the while in a perfect body on the table close by. And they are all so beautiful, so hyper, hyper beauties. Where are the inflicted, the broken, the harmed by lives? Time to take it off. Time to fill in the plaster. Fabulous, she says. It's going to be fabulous. And that's it. Now we take a big jump and come to a traditional dilemma. Traditional dilemma. In October 1950, Alan Turing argues between science and religion, clearly siding with his own unshaken belief in science and the creative mind. And there's a footnote one. In July 1858, Charles Darwin Esquire agrees to write a letter on the edge between science and religion, somewhat timidly, but with an uncorruptible belief in science and the lawfulness of observation. Footnote two. They had had Galileo revoking some time ago, another century, similar string of arguments, and what today you'd call a shit storm. And this is a footnote three. Now all the footnotes are referring to papers, um, which I spare you. Thank you all. How are y'all doing? I'm going to read a, a few poems, starting with the oldest, which is as old as dirt to me now, although where I live, they just have clay. In any case, it's from a, a manuscript um, called Pontchartrain or what have I done. Want to build a birdhouse out of my mother and the ringing in my ears, which never leaves me and births me. When I try to relax, I read a book with pictures of dead people, the living ones who fuck you when you are in a dream wearing antlers, silently weeping. Her husband 
is a despicable man, or he is not a man at all. He is a bird that walks with grace along the ties of the tracks. Wouldn't know it was a mistake for six months. Asked Alan for old poems because I was unhappy with my own. And he said he had burned them, by which he meant deleted them. His girlfriend had torqued too much while blowing him, and he lost a ball, and the antibiotics they gave him tingled his body for half a year. He was a metal worker, but he quit, and we huddled there in the sand on the wharf where rats go, the unconscious in the earbud. I've been writing a poem about when Dixie grocery bags full of money folded up at the end of a whip in the mouth of a live feed from helicopters that sound like a horse breaking wind in such a dark place. Don't understand why this is racist or prisonerish or slave-like. Something falls out then metamorphosis. Protocol that has no soul but talks to you anyway over its horrible crinkling. I hope you never laugh again when you should be in bed pulling someone with the breath of a bonsai tree onto your chest. A love cry after Albert Eiler. Penetrated insofar one took for granted that about ethical, moral, philosophical things seriously spoken and thought. Her poems are read under the influence. Her eyes are read from continual weeping, continually perish. She may be dressed in night vision house red. And how am I supposed to do that? Been a very good friend to you. Really? Ray seems along and along it erect red axis phonemes cespitose instead of confined to the nerves. The banshee is a predicate. To come from keen as verb from dilation, clocks fasten at the neck. It pulls you, just drop out. Fanny Howe dedicated herself to self-impoverishment. Kodak monument, cortex stylized as shame. Read continual, she would sing. It, when a family member died or was about to die, even if the person died, had not yet come to threshing of the house. Hold red, like hell you have. Plan, promise, expectation, obligation, Orinus, check. Hitch to one vision is one inch, the practice of watching over red, washing, kneeling, clapping over a core sample. And um, finally, I'll end with uh, what I wrote in response in part to Federico's prompt. I have to leave it up in part because it's a little uh, um, choppy. Clamor set TJ. There's another one. She plates. That's just my glasses and eyes. That would be even better. To the bridge, topless. What the heck is that on your head? Sleeps on 30 hoodies. Le fleur du misogyny. She drools to the bridge, topless psycho, inveterate. They will make a 1,000 piece puzzle out of a picture. What chimera is this? And everyone's at work on it blindly. So to have you, the children to bed, the dishes done, no evidentiary meaning, gradually emerge as a guess. What the heck is that? A kinging. At risk, family psychodrone, she aphasic, got jumped, drooling. That should be your next author photo. I'm sure it would be even more apt. Psychokinesis, it's called society to forget on a moving billboard. Should look but don't, and feathered but don't, that gathers wherever everyone's whistles and dots and blacks out. Signal has gone wrong by moment. K, says a trimeter, teenager crests, dawn of ape crests, his nipple enfolds or blossom, how lees from vain. Do you know, really, boots moon? Is that? 
In moon of boats, ex arraignment of throats, those they guess at turgid cornfield collapse her forehead. It's called surveillance, and the inside is fucked. Mnemonic. Bifurcated, her heart new world multiples of comb tooth, and it's harps that send me to the night horse candy. And how am I supposed to do that? Thank you. Thank you so much, Ben. Let's give it up for everyone who came uh, in this last set as well. Um, I'm almost set to introduce the Nick, the last two readers for tonight because it means the event's going to come to a close. Um, and it really feels like we're in this like, little bubble of our own across all the different time zones and space. But yes, <laughs> we will get to that. Um, so our second last reader, I'm going to introduce the last, the last two readers um, in a group again, and then they're going to show up and then you'll read after, yeah? Okay, so um, our first reader of this last set is Rhea Ma'ak. She is originally from Marinduque in the Philippines and has been working in Singapore since 2010. Her poem was shortlisted in the Migrant Worker Poetry Competition Singapore in 2017. Uh, Miguel Garcia is our second reader. Hi, Miguel. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Miguel, uh, sorry, Miguel Garcia writes poetry and performs spoken word about family, boyhood, and history. They completed their PhD in decision neuroscience and began performing in Switzerland's poetry slam scene. So without further ado, let's um, welcome Rhea onto the screen. Rhea, are you there? Awesome, Rhea. All right, you go and do your reading. Hello, good evening, everyone. My poem was inspired by Fernando Amazola's painting, which is the rice planting. It did impact in my life because I myself is a daughter of a farmer. Rip and so. As I gaze on the luminous sky, wearing pale blue to the daytime, inside of me, it's a remote feeling, reminiscing how we survive through farming. No worries, like yeah, I think. Yeah, it looks like Rhea has frozen, but that's okay. Um, Miguel, maybe we'll bring you up in front first until Rhea's um, internet connection is sorted. Yeah, thanks, okay. Miguel. All right. Uh, so, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you to uh, Singlet Station and Sans Journal for, for, for this. Uh, for this invitation. Um, Okay, so Hi, sorry. Uh, so Rhea, we've we've switched the order. So if you can go after Miguel now. Um. Okay, so the poem that I'll be I'll be reading is uh, inspired from uh, Marth Rothko's um, Red and Maroon series. Uh, the so this the paint so the the paintings are here at the, at the Tate Modern. And I've always been fascinated of the not just the paintings, paintings themselves, but also uh, the environment that it exudes while you're in there. So here's the poem. Um, there, the Lord's Prayer is the crescent, waxing where a candle sweats a bead of bullets, candle smoke dancing with Molotov. All that blood drained of words, a sinkhole on contested earth. There is no body part left to scrape to describe the exit wound on walls. The exit door is full of worshippers pushing and praying to a Rothko portrait. A red door, refusing to budge like the police outside the temple wall, interlocking arms performing a long rosary bead. Perhaps they too have prayer, 
But the reason why they look like rosaries was because my father chained my mother's wrists with rosary and choked my sister with his belt. My brother was dead inside that he took a jug of gasoline and made our father into the image and brightness of the sun. In heaven, there is promise of redemption, but our house is a burning temple and holy be damned demons who took my name away while father was dancing aflame. The way faith is a flicker on a candle, climbing, desperate not to fall from its wick, while a crowd of red hot wax is pushing the door to open before they stopped cold. What is left is a crowd of bodies made of cool and rough ash, and the temple has sound full of heavy metal falling, metal, melted gold and copper, all that silver on the floor, the lonely cracked skull, the free molar. Freedom was for my mother. Her prayer echoed the halls before police occupied the empty temple home and dragged my faith away. Here I say, amen. Thank you. All right, Rhea, just unmute yourself, then we can get started. Hello. Hello, good evening, everyone, again. Sorry for that. Rip and so. As I gaze on the luminous sky wearing pale blue, of the daytime. Inside of me is a remote feeling, reminiscing how we survived through farming as our main source of living. Under the scorching sun, everyone carries on, sweat dripping with the distance between the seedlings from eye to hand, the toughness of the back and arms, legs feel a thousand tricks. Two feet in the thick mud, cannot move forward. Like a baby's too young to walk, move a step backwards under the threat of being stuck and paying attention to the leeches that suck blood. Knowing that behind every bending of the knee where they bow constantly is a mental groan, an ache to bear, so that one day, they will have food to share. Their fingers pushing seedlings to soil, each life arranged in the form of invisible line from left to right, each gap shows how the spaces form. Unable to sit, yet refusing to surrender, must finish the task until their faces kiss by the dusk, yet real struggles are unknown to those not on the farmer's zone. Once again, I look back on the sky as the moon facing towards me. I wonder, does anyone know the rice on their plate once coated with soil? Does anyone know each and every grain was soaked with toil? Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you so much, Miguel and Mia. Thank you so much. That was so powerful. It's been, it's been a really incredible reading. Um, and, and it's really amazing to see all these people coming together and, and interacting with all these different art forms. And, um, and uh, yeah, and we, we've got people in pretty much every time zone that could possibly be in today <laughs> from starting at seven in the morning in, in Louisiana to, I don't know what time it is now in, in Singapore, I guess. Uh, I can. <laughs> well, <laughs> Um, so I just, uh, I, I actually forgot to plug our own project, SAND. Um, so for those of you who are watching this um, and don't know who we are, 
Uh, Sand is an independent literary and arts journal based in Berlin, and we've uh, been publishing um, our journal since 2009, and uh, we just came out with our 22nd issue, um, which you can find on our website. And uh, we also do various events online and per perhaps again off. So if you want to find out more, uh, you can sign up for our newsletter or follow us on uh, social media. The same goes for Singlet Station. And if you went to that link that Ruby's been posting on um, the intermingled page on the SAN website, um, you also have the opportunity, if you'd like to support either uh, Singlet Station or Sand. Um, there is a donation button, but this is a free reading, so it's completely optional. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you so much for watching and for coming. And thank you all so much uh, to all of the readers for um, for joining in from your various time zones and for writing those beautiful poems. Um, Charlene, do you have any other last words? <laughs> I mean, you pretty much said everything I wanted to say. But yeah, thank you so much, everyone, for listening in. Thank you to our readers for doing such a great job um, and for having such a nice time for us to spend on a Sunday night. It's a great start to the upcoming week for us here in Singapore. Yeah, um, I think also like, you know, do follow like San as well as Singlet Station on social media just to be updated about what we're doing. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Great. Well, um, I would like to finally uh, invite everyone who's just read back onto the screen so that we can all, um, you can all give each other a round of applause and the people at home, you can virtually clap or, you know, cheer them all on. Um, thank you so much for being here. We really enjoyed your reading. Um, and uh, if you want to unmute, we could try to actually create a round of applause. Um, <laughs> I don't know if it'll work. <laughs> okay, it was an attempt. Thank you all so much. And um, I hope to see you again soon in some other physical or virtual format. And uh, um, you can find everyone's work and their um, more of their poems uh, through the bio. Um, you find their websites and their um, publications. Thanks a lot. Have a great Sunday. Thank you, everyone. Bye.